So Evan, I had quite a few questions for, for Bracey and I do have some for you too. Let's go. Very inspired today. Um, I love inspired Miriam. How, how is your transition from playing sport? It had its ups and downs, I would say. Um, I think that's only natural from when you spend a great majority of your life uh, doing one thing and then you, you know, kind of phase out of that thing. Um, it has been, you know, in all honesty, a little more difficult than I thought it would be. I actually, I read uh, something that a friend of mine, he put on LinkedIn about how a lot of athletes, when they transition away from sports, they get caught in that um, mindset of going to the first thing that they can think of. And they kind of just settle into that because they don't really, you know, know anything else. Mm -hmm. So they look for maybe like the safe route to take. And I did that initially. Um, I thought about, you know, sticking around basketball, maybe coaching basketball, because that's what I knew. That's what I had always been around. And for me, that was like being in the comfort zone and, and being safe, but uh, it just didn't resonate with me. So it was, you know, a very challenging period to say, okay, I'm going to step away to something completely different than what I spent the last 20 years of my life doing and start from the ground up. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm start from the bottom and just um, enjoy this process. So it has been difficult, but I think the greatest thing that this transition has uh, allowed me to learn is just really about myself. You know, uh, stepping away from basketball and not seeking to get right back into it because it was the safe route has allowed me to learn uh, so much about you know, what's true for me, listening to myself and um, following my intuition and my instinct. And more so than ever with this COVID-19 and not really being able to move freely, uh, it has given me the opportunity to just, uh, you know, be still and slow down. And that in itself has given me a lot more time to reflect, to think. And so I think from in the six, you know, maybe six to seven months since I stopped playing, I've grown so much more than I would have imagined. That for me has been, you know, the biggest plus. Uh, the most difficult thing is just learning to live without basketball, learning to live um, a life that, you know, I didn't imagine five, six years ago. But you know, it's, uh, it's been, it's been fun. It's been interesting. It's been enlightening. And most importantly, it's been, um, you know, what I have wanted from myself within and it's not what anyone else is wanting for me. So that's, that for me is super important. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, this is, this is really interesting because I just got off the phone a moment ago and a lot of the questions they were asking me were about my transition, uh, leaving, leaving coaching and, and kind of leading to where I was now. And Miriam, you and I have talked about this, the pivot or the transition. And you mentioned it a moment ago, Bracey, and I think it's really important for athletes to understand it is not a moment. Your pivot, your transition is not a moment. It is a process. It is an ongoing path of learning and failing. And I actually spent quite a bit of time talking about my failures, specifically in like the two years after leaving coaching, trying to do a business I thought I wanted to do, doing a job that quite honestly I failed at. And those were incredibly powerful experiences looking back. Obviously in the moment, yeah, you know, I had an incredible amount of success in my coaching career. And you have to start back from the bottom. And yeah. it's hard in the moment. I think like understanding, and I kind of was trying to tell these people this on the last call, like it was not always easy. It was not like I was always a 10 out of 10 in terms of like, you know, my emotional uh, well-being or kind of like my positivity. We all go through those dips. And I think just kind of like learning that that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. And also that part of this process is learning and trying new things. So Miriam, I know you have a ton of questions. I just want to jump in here real quick and ask Bracey 
like you mentioned learning and I'm mm -hmm. just curious kind of like as you go down this learning path like talk to us about how you're learning currently you mentioned earlier about books uh, you know alchemists I also that's my favorite book so I 100% I mm -hmm. agree with you on that but like how are you doing your learning currently is it is it through books is it through um, you know exploration with conversations with people are there other avenues that you're also exploring right now as you enter this next phase of your life um, that's a good question Evan. Um, I would say mainly it's through reading I'm not reading a ton of books uh, but what I try to do is find maybe a small amount of books and really study those books, um, you know, to soak up everything I can. I think, you know, if I'm reading, you know, 20, 30 books, you know, for me, I'm not really uh, learning, you know, the way that I could be if I'm reading two and I'm really studying those. So right now, uh, I have maybe two to three books uh, that I'm learning from. And then, like you said, exploration. A lot of, um, you know, reflection, examining of myself, meditation, writing, uh, experimentation. So it's just all of those things, not necessarily conversations with other people, uh, but I am in the phase of kind of seeing that maybe all that I've always thought of myself may not be what is true of me. So I'm doing more so kind of like detaching from a lot of the old ways that I used to be. And just filling that space um, with new things that come up that kind of resonate with me more than anything else. And I think through those three vehicles of, you know, experimentation and exploration and, you know, uh, reading books, that's currently how I'm getting uh, the best, you know, value in, in this time and, and most of my learning is coming from. That's cool. I like your... Um... I like your methodology of focusing on just a couple of books and, and really becoming an expert in them too. I think especially our society as a whole is just, you know, how many books can you read? Uh, right. CEOs read 70 books a year. And I think it was Bruce Lee that said he fears not the man that has tried a thousand punches. It's that the man that has tried one punch a thousand times. And I think, you know, really mm. being an expert in one thing um, that's kind of what it takes. It's not necessarily hitting as many different points of view as possible. It's kind of like you said, honing in on the, the few that really resonate with you and really mm -hmm. taking a deep dive into them. And I love that. Absolutely, man. That is deep saying by Bruce Lee. I, I had never heard of that, but that's very accurate. Yeah. I think what I like too is, um, there's a big part of the transition that is about, and we talked about it a, a moment ago, Gracie, and, I'd love to come back um, to it, but it, it's this switch in life between being self-centered because you have to as an athlete. Mm -hmm. You are so deep into your skill and developing your, your game that your whole person, your whole mind is completely centered on that to be mm -hmm. at the highest level possible. And so you're sort of the center of your own world with people like watching you uh literally and yes. then you retire and you know you have to transition into this life of finding your position in the world as a humble member of society like everybody else and it's a it's a very different situation and it has a huge impact on on your ego and i mentioned you know how do, how are you doing as a as a parent, as a single dad, and, <laughs> and do you remember your life before that? And I think like transitioning from being an athlete to post athletics or, or from being a, a single person to a parent, um, there are some similarities in it of like yes. taking a step back about yourself. Um, and maybe you can tell us a bit more about, you know, what you've experienced as a single dad and your biggest learning because I think there are some really parallel with the transition of from athletics. Yeah, um, I I definitely agree with. It's one of those things where the kind of similarity I see is in parenting. They tell you 
doesn't really matter how much you prepare for it, you're really never going to be quite ready until it happens. And for me, I, you know, I don't know about, uh, you know, everybody, but for me, I, I think that's kind of on point with transitioning away from you know, anything that you've done for an extended period of time, you know, for me, athletics, mm-hmm. is that, you know, you can prepare for uh, so much of what life after your sport is going to be. But you're never going to be quite ready until you're actually living that life. You're not really going to understand what it feels like to be without that locker room, to be without that, you know, camaraderie, to be without that schedule that you kept for all of those years. Nothing is really going to put you in that uh, mindset before you get there, you know, until you're actually there. Uh, so I, I think that is like really the the similarities that I see. As far as being a uh, single parent, um, like I told you before, you know, I think that's one of my biggest um, challenges, one of my biggest lessons uh, in this life. For sure, I've come to the realization that uh, one of my sons, if if not, you know, all of my kids, but definitely one in particular, he is my, uh, he's my biggest teacher and probably my biggest challenge. and I say that because he, he's so much like me. Um, you know, he soaks up everything that I do. He, he makes me really aware of the steps that I take, you know, kind of, of how I'm doing things because he's basically reflecting those things back to me, which I think, you know, a lot of kids do with their parents. Um, but he has, through our conversations, I've, I've never spoke to my kids like, children you know i speak to them like i'm speaking you know to you and evan um and you know like they're whole human beings that's just how i I, i've always spoke to them so through some of you know our conversations me and my my middle child you know i've had to learn to kind of step back and see that okay you know this kid you know he has a mind of his own and you know he has an intelligence the same thing that created me created him he has his own path that uh, is not the path that I may want for him. It may not be best for him. You know, his path is his path. And he's taught me a lot more than books that I read and some of the, you know, self-reflection that I do. Just because of the fact that um, being a single parent, you want that control. And, you know, that's not always the best way to go. And when you have a child who's growing up, who is curious and wondrous about the world, um, you know, they have their own way that they want to think. They have their own way that they want to do. And so he's taught me so much about myself. He's taught me so much about how to be a parent. And he's taught me a lot about just, um, you know, being curious and being, you know, wondrous about what the world is and how things happen in the world. So. Definitely as a single parent, it hasn't been easy. It's never going to be easy when your kids outnumber you. <laughs> but uh, but for sure, um, like I told, like you said before, you know, it's much different thinking back on life before kids than it is with kids. I can't imagine going back to life without kids, but uh, it's definitely very different having them and not having them. You talked about being still and using the time with COVID to sort of reflect. And I was just curious if you, if you, you, Evan Burke, do, do you ever stop? So it's still. So it's so funny because I noticed that too. And I was like, wow, Bracey and I are having very different COVID experiences. <laughs> um, I've been uh, nonstop since all of this has happened. I've actually probably been the busiest I have been since my coaching career, like in the last two months. And, um, you know, again, like I think a lot of this has to do with like my default mentality and maybe I do need to take a step back. Miriam is always encouraging me, like you need to go on a walk, you need to settle down. Uh, but my default is to, to really grind and, and work hard. And so when we kind of, entered into the space about two months ago and Miriam and I really kind of started to have conversations around, well, maybe we should kind of shift our thinking 
around a couple of things, right? Obviously, live events are not going to be happening. Maybe we should do online events and everything that comes with that. It really just kind of sent me into a space where I was quite honestly energized Mm -hmm. by all the work that we could currently do. Um, and, and so it's, it's definitely been a different COVID experience for me because my mentality has been, I'm in this lane right now and I am going to sprint. And mm. I've always kind of like had this mentality that like, I've always worked seven days a week. Like it's like since I was 19, 20 years old and I started my coaching career, even when I was in college, I was working seven days a week. So for me, my mentality is like, oh, everybody's going to be chill. Not, not that you are, Bracey. <laughs> like, say, like, you know, in my head, in my own mind, I'm like, oh, it's Saturday, it's Sunday. Well, I'm gonna like, like, I'm gonna get a whole day advantage, right? With these people, and you know, one of my favorite sayings from Kobe was he's telling a story about like early on in his career, and he's like, yeah, so, you know, a typical off season for an NBA player. And Bracey, you could probably speak more to this than I can, but you know, you're probably waking up at eight, you're probably working out at 10, you're eating lunch, you're probably working out again at two, and then you're, you know, doing your, um, your kind of like your rehab and your, your wind down for the day. And Kobe was like, well, what if I got up at four and mm-hmm. worked out at, worked out at four and then worked out at eight and then worked out at 12 and then worked out at three? You yeah. know? <clears throat> so I'm gaining a day on every single NBA player, every single day of the off season. He exactly. kind of talks about, he's like four or five years down the road. He's like, you can't catch me. And uh, not saying that I'm taking the Mamba mentality every single day, but that honestly is one of like the pieces of like my mindset that I'm always like, Oh, it's Saturday. Well, like I'm at least going to get work done. Uh, and this goes back to like the way my mom treated me when I was growing up. And it was like, it didn't have to be a full day of work, but every Saturday and Sunday, it was always like, what are we going to get accomplished? Mm. What are we going to do that we're going to be productive today? And it could just be a homework assignment and it could just be reading or it could just be one little thing. But it was that mentality that like before we spend the rest of the day in front of the television or playing video games, we're going to do something productive. And that just kind of naturally grew for me. So. Thank you, Mary. I like that though. For I like that. I respect my workaholic yeah. tendencies. I do respect that. Yeah, and I, I remember that quote. Uh, I mean, not necessarily not necessarily a quote, but uh, the saying from Kobe. I remember him uh, speaking about that, and that's true. And, and I see, you know, kind of the similarity to what you were talking about, Evan, of how the the mode you were in of just sprinting in this lane. I was in that mind frame when I first moved away from basketball and I I was into the personal, you know, coaching, I was just like, my feet hit the ground and I'm running every single day. And that's why for a long time, I didn't think about basketball because I was just moving at such a fast pace as trying to be a personal coach, you know, uh, building coaching programs and packages and, you know, just trying to go in that space. But then as, you know, a couple of months ago, I started to kind of see that that really uh, didn't kind of, you know, sit well with me, didn't resonate with me. So then I had to really slow down a whole lot more. So I didn't want to jump into something different and start sprinting again. But I do uh, understand where you're coming from, because it's definitely, you know, when you find a lane that you really want to be in and you find something that you really uh enjoy doing and have a you know great time doing it, a love for it you want to you know go as fast as you can at it and you want to push yourself and keep working so i do respect that i I think it's also just interesting to point out too especially for all the athletes out there like we're at different points in our transition right like Mm -hmm. mentioned it earlier bracy you're you're kind of still exploring and you kind of found something you want to explore and maybe this is a better fit for where you are in your life right now, this uh, speed, for lack of a better term. Um, and then, like, I've kind of identified that I don't do well uh, just, right. just hanging out. And, like, I, I'm, this is my default mode, and this is where I get a lot of my um, pleasure and, and mm-hmm. excitement and enjoyment. And so, you know, I'm really fired up to have a lot of things that I am interested in doing and, and am invested in to where working on them seven days a week, even if it's just an hour or two on a weekend, 
still is something that I don't mind doing. So I think that's important too, to recognize that yeah. you and I were two totally different people and we're coming at it from our own perspectives and, um, you know, we're going to handle everything differently. And it's important for athletes to kind of understand that too, that it's okay to yes. slow down and take your time. But it's also important too, that when you find something like you better lean into that because I've been mm -hmm. in plenty of situations in my life where I haven't had something to lean into. And uh, I totally identify with the people that are out there because that's a, that's a tough place to be in too. So when you do find something that you really do want to lean into, it's like really kind of commit yourself to that. That's true. The transition is not going to be, uh, you know, a plug and play or one size fits all. And I think, you know, at the end of everything, it has to be about what works best for you, what resonates with you. And, and as long as you're sticking to, you know, like you said before in our previous conversation, that North Star, then, you know, it'll all, you know, move smoothly for you. Totally. How, um, um, I've been toying with this question a little bit of how often do you guys try to put yourself in a discomfort situation to accelerate your learning? So I think the three of us are fairly uh, routine oriented. Uh, mm -hmm. we like, you know, this gives us comfort and it helps us be more uh, productive to like mm -hmm. follow a daily routine and, and, and really stick to it. And so I'm always like curious on like, how often do you step away from this in a discomfort zone to like progress or learn more or, or just discover something about yourself? I, I just wondered if you, if you ask yourself that question. Um, what's your answer? Um, I try to do it uh, as often as possible. Um, I don't know if I do it every day, but I definitely try to find some way um, to do that as often as possible. I, I know, you know, a lot of it comes from, you know, playing sports. You know what I mean? You're training and you're pushing yourself and you don't think you have much to give, but you have another gear that you can get to. And it's about getting yourself uncomfortable in training and practice. So in the games, you know, it's much more comfortable for you. So uh, for me that, you know, that applies in, to learning. So I try to do it each day with my routine of, you know, waking up, I wake up in the mornings to um, my evening routines to just um, the questions I kind of, ask myself or sitting with a certain question for maybe a week that may be uncomfortable or, or maybe an emotion that I'm going through instead of trying to quickly pass through that emotion, maybe sit with that emotion and find what it's trying to teach me. Uh, that has been, you know, keeping me in some uncomfortable uh, situations. I love, that, but it's, I, mean, I, yeah. I love that sitting with the emotion because that's what you do on the field of play mm -hmm. every day you have similar emotions that you have to like learn to deal with and overcome and i think it's really interesting that you still try to practice that i try but you know what to to that point um i don't know how you know was for you you know when, when you were uh, swimming and stuff but for me like if i was dealing with any kind of emotional stuff I would always just try to quickly deal with it and let it go when I was playing or when I was you know uh, working and stuff like that I would just try to just drop it and not even deal with it and just get away from it and that was the habit that I was falling into of when I had any kind of emotion uh, going on I would quickly always go back to that default of I need to push it to the side and that was causing me, you know, some conflict. And I had to learn, you know, a little bit the hard way of really sitting with, with those emotions and allowing them the space to be and instead of uh, trying to get rid of them so fast or, you know, pretending that, you know, they're not there or repress them, you know, just had to uh, learn to sit with those. And But it, it wasn't something that I learned from playing. I, it was the opposite. I learned to just uh, not deal with them you know, as a player, because I didn't want them to distract me from what I was doing on the court. And it kind of worked, you know, against me now. 
Yeah, I can relate to that. I think athletes generally, you know, push through and repress their their feelings because that's the easiest way to continue to move forward. Yeah, I agree with that. And the stigma of athletes are usually, you know, not supposed to uh, show emotions that are considered maybe like a weakness. Um, and and then you get into the thought where you can't show those emotions, you can't deal with those emotions, but they always come back up. You know, I just enjoy the questions and the the coffee conversation, as you guys put it. We've dropped the coffee today. <laughs> well, some of us have already had quite a bit of coffee, so it's like get get a little like uh, water in my system to like bring me down a little bit. Do you drink coffee, Bracey? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't drink coffee. After all these no. years in Europe, you you haven't started. No, that was um, it was one thing I was asked a lot about. You know, living in Europe, you know, you don't drink coffee. Everybody drinks coffee. I drink coffee at night over there. I don't know if they do it here, but um, yeah, it was the weirdest thing for me. Yeah, right. Uh, no, I've never been a coffee drinker. Never even. I think I tried it maybe once or twice. It was horrible. So I, I never, no, not for me. It's kind of an acquired taste. It it really is. Yeah, it really is. And and there's also like another piece to it too, where it's almost like I think I like the routine of coffee. Mm. We're sitting here talking about how to get out of our routine, but I really enjoy. I can tell you within three minutes of me waking up, like I've already like heated the water, like I'm already making my coffee. Like this mm -hmm. is the first thing I do and it really kind of sets a nice tone to my day. And I really like that. And you know, it's like, I don't even know if the coffee I drink is all that fantastic or premium or anything like that. I just enjoy the routine of like having something warm in my hands and, and kind of easing into my day, at least that first 15, 30 minutes with that cup of coffee. So. Right. I think it's almost about the routine than it is the coffee. I agree with that. Might be for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in Europe it's definitely the case. It's either a moment to sit still and observe the world. Like if you live in, in Paris, there's definitely you sit down at a little coffee table outside watching the life goes by. It's kind of a pose. Or you, it's a social event where you do that with people. It's really nice. Yeah. Um and the same goes on for tea time in England. Like when I lived in England, in in coach with the English English coaches, you had to get on with the uh, the tea tea time, whether it was in the morning or the afternoon. It seems that it was tea time all the time. But that was just an excuse to like sit down and talk. Um, and so I think it's as much as the moment that you pass with people, you spend with people than the, the, the drinking stuff. I mean, you could be drinking water. It doesn't really matter. You're just posing to socialize or, or look at as time goes by. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bracey, thank you so much for joining us here on Coffee Combos, and we will see you guys next week. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Bracey. Thank Welcome you, back Mary. anytime, Bracey. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I hope you guys invite me back again soon.